In 2014, Sony released a camera that would go on to become a dominating force across the filmmaking community, being used across a huge range of productions and redefining the look of the content that we all watch on a daily basis today. The look of broadcast, documentary, branded content, corporate, short film, and online video were all reimagined by this legendary camera. Today, we are taking a look at the incredibly popular Sony PXW FS7, almost 10 years since its release. Before we get into the video, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you want to sell any of your pre-owned kit or buy any of our professionally evaluated used kit, head over to cvp.com. The FS7 has been the most popular video camera in the UK since 2017, when it overtook the equally as important Canon C300. However, it finally fell out of the two top spots last year, thanks to the rise of its younger brothers, the FX6 and the FX9. Over the years, so much has been shot on the FS7, for a few good reasons. First of which was the image that it produces. The FS7 uses a single chip Super 35 XMOS CMOS sensor, which in its DCI 4K mode, uses a sensor size of 23.757 by 12.528 millimeters giving it a diagonal of 26.858 millimeters and a pixel pitch of 5.8 microns. Super 35 was pretty standard at this point, but 4K recording was the big thing and the image that the FS7 captures was fantastic at the time, especially given the price at release. It had a decently fast sensor readout speed, but it's not as quick as the modern full frame ones in the FX cameras, which isn't too surprising. In HD, you can toggle between using the full sensor as well as a crop, which was helpful for people shooting in HD wanting to get a bit of extra reach out of their lenses. The full HD when using the full sensor could result in some pretty rough looking footage, so I would really steer clear of that if you do decide to shoot one of these cameras, just shoot 4K. The camera has the ability to switch between two different shooting modes, Cine EI and Custom. This completely changes the way the camera behaves. Cine EI turned the camera into a cinema camera, whereas Custom was more designed for broadcast and fast acquisition stuff. This has now become pretty common across Sony's modern cameras, but back then, this was a big feature. Being able to switch the camera into essentially two different cameras was a big thing. Cine EI allows you to get the most dynamic range and overall image quality, but requires processing in post and a more complex exposure methodology, compared to the very point and shoot publish workflow when shooting in custom mode. When shooting in Cine EI, the camera has a native ISO of 2000 in S-Log3, which would allow you to capture up to 14 stops of dynamic range, which is still impressive today. You will just have to deal with some of the quirks of shooting in this mode that modern Sony cameras don't have anymore. When shooting with the FS7, it was common for people to overexpose to help with noise performance. I often shot at ISO 500 in this mode to try and help with the noise, but different people had different ways to try and get the best results out of the camera without blowing out your highlights. The FS7 had a reputation for producing purpley pinky images, and while this was the case sometimes, Sony did update the firmware to try and fix this. However, the FS7 certainly has a look. It was pretty common for the footage to be mishandled back then, as the concept of vlog was still quite new for editors and post-production as a whole. Now though, people understand how to get the best out of the FS7 and S-Log, so you can get some really good looking results from the FS7 still even this long after release. The FS7 featured an incredibly versatile set of frame rates, codecs, and formats, which allowed it to easily slide into cinema, broadcast, or content workflows. This included XAVCI, XAVCL, MPEG-2, and ProRes if you attach the XDCA FS7. With the XDCA, you could also shoot RAW externally if you just grabbed an external recorder that can record the signal coming out of it. Back then, the Atomos Shogun was popular, and so was the Odyssey 7Q+, which I really, really miss. Having all of these options allows you to shoot and deliver to a large range of production needs, whether that's broadcast or cinema. Another feature the FS7 had, which was massive at the time, was the ability to capture 4K up to 60 frames per second and Full HD up to 180 frames per second in its slow and quick mode. These were very impressive frame rates for the time, and it just added to the camera's versatility. The slow mode also looked pretty good for the time, but just note that you can't record audio in its slow and quick mode. The body design of the FS7 is still great. It's a nice mix of feeling solid while also being lightweight. The camera was praised for its ability to be pulled straight out of the box and be ready to put onto your shoulder, ready for shooting. Out of the box, it came with a little shoulder pad, 
the loop for the monitor and an extendable arm grip, which made operating on the shoulder pretty easy, but you could make it better with a few pieces of rigging if you needed to. The grip on the end of the extendable arm is really good. It has menu control, a record button, and a zoom rocker for servo-driven lenses. This made it easy for many camera operators who were used to broadcast cameras at the time to transition over to this new camera system. It feels really nice in the hand and allows you to control so much from your fingertips. The top handle is also really nice still. It has a record button on it as well, which is really helpful. Its longer, shorter body was more popular for shoulder configurations over other cameras on the market at the time, which again resonated with the broadcast crowd. But of course, it wasn't perfect, and there were quirks that would get refined in future cameras. The camera also comes with this little loop that you could attach to the included LCD monitor. For something that's included with the camera, it's great. The monitor is really easy to reposition as well, which means that you can really configure how you want the camera to be laid out. The side of the camera was also pretty well thought out as well for on-shoulder configurations. You can control lots without needing to look at the camera once you get used to where everything is on the side of it. The menu is a bit slow and clunky compared to modern FX cameras, but it is very usable still with some tweaks. The camera also has an ND system built in, where you can go from clear, two, four, and six stops. It's not a bad range by any stretch, but does seem dated now compared to modern options, especially when you compare it to Sony's electronic ND, which was first introduced in the FS5. However, at the time, this was a great feature to have, and I'm sure there are plenty of run and gun operators thankful for them while shooting. The FS7 uses XQD cards to record onto, which compared to the F5 or F55's media type was a much more affordable option. They were still pretty expensive though compared to other options at the time, but much less than others. Surprisingly, the FS7 lacks two things that a lot of people might expect it to have built into the body, timecode and genlock. It does have a good range of inputs and outputs such as multiple SDIs, a 4K HDMI, and two full-size XLRs. But to get timecode and genlock, you'll need to use the XDCA extension unit, which adds a bunch of functionality to the camera. The FS7's dual XLR inputs allowed for the acquisition of good sounding audio easily with professional microphones. And you could even record four channels of audio when using either the Sony UWP series of wireless mic receiver or the XLR K1 or 2M. Again, this adds to its versatility. The preamps are also excellent and you have loads of control, which is great for this type of run and gun documentary camera. This video has been focused around the first version of the FS7, but there is also a Mark II. The Mark II brings an improved electronic variable ND, which is similar to the one found in the FS5 and the modern FX style cameras. It also has a locking E-mount, which is better for longer, heavier lenses, but I would say is harder to use in run and gun shooting scenarios. The arm for the grip is also improved as it is tallest to change the length of the arm, though most with the original FS7 would grab a replacement arm from the likes of Shape, which was much faster to adjust than the normal one. There was also a few more specific physical changes across the body to improve it, such as more user buttons. The FS7 uses Sony's E-mount, which back then was still as versatile as it is today, though Sony's catalogue of lenses wasn't quite as vast as it is now. Some people did use it with native E-mount lenses, but the autofocus on the FS7 is pretty basic, and some of the older Sony lenses did not give video shooters the best manual focus experience, so a lot of people would opt to use adapted lenses, with the most common choice being Canon's EF range. Using adapted lenses required an adapter, and back then, Metabones dominated this market, offering both a regular pass-through adapter and a speed booster option. Seeing a speed booster on an FS7 was incredibly common, because people wanted that full frame look and the extra top of light that you would get when using a focal reducer. But now times have changed. Full frame sensors are more common, autofocus has gotten really, really good, and Sony's native lenses now have a much, much better manual focus experience thanks to their updated XD linear motors. You could of course also adapt PL mount lenses onto the camera, which plenty of productions would also do. The short flange of E-mount made it really flexible, and you could get some super lightweight configurations compared to other cameras in the market at the time, like the F5 or F55. Being able to use stills lenses in these configurations is a big reason why it became so popular in run and gun documentary work. When the FS7 came out, the pricing was incredibly aggressive compared to the rest of the market, and that was another huge reason why it was picked up so much. Well, in 2023, the FS7 can be purchased for between a thousand to three thousand pounds depending on the condition and the kit that it comes with. 
considering what this camera features and the image quality that you can get out of it, it could be an awesome option for budget conscious filmmakers wanting a versatile camera that blends excellent reliability, solid image quality, and a pull out of the bag and go design. Though it definitely does have its quirks still, and when compared to modern cameras, it does look dated when it comes to usability and feature set, but it does have a fantastic price for what you get. There are plenty of FS7 still available in the wild to rent, but they are being replaced slowly by FX series cameras. These new full frame counterparts do improve on the FS cameras a good amount, but the FS7 can still produce good imagery and get the job done. And really, I can see it being popular for years to come still. If you are seriously thinking about buying one of these cameras, one thing to think about is that some of them are going to be heavily, heavily used. This makes buying them as well as other used kit a bit of a minefield, but that can be made easier when buying used equipment from us due to our 90 day warranty on pretty much all of our used stock. Our used marketplace consists of pre-loved X-Demo and showroom equipment that is professionally evaluated and serviced by our in-house pro repairs engineers. If you want to see what we currently have in stock, head over to cvp.com used. We also buy used kit, so if you want to upgrade or just clear out your old stock fast and easily, get in contact with us via the email below. We are also a Sony service center who works on FS7s all the time, so if you ever have any issues with your camera, just reach out to us. Anyway, if you have any more thoughts or questions about the FS7, let us know in the comments. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.